There we go. Perfect. Right. So um, I also think it's useful that people know uh, a little bit about uh, who's actually talking to you. Um, so uh, to give you a bit of background about me, um, I've now been working as a senior leader in uh, international schools uh, for about eight years. Um, prior to that, I've been sort of uh, teaching for 20 years, both internationally and in the UK, and um, I've worked in the UAE. I was in uh, Dubai for four years, uh, and I've been in Romania now for about uh, five years. In fact, I'm just about to enter my sixth year at my current school. Um, I've taught in British curriculum schools and IB world schools, um, but I'm also uh, involved now in sort of accreditation and inspection as well. So within the UK, I am a uh, inspector for the Independent Schools Inspectorate, uh, and I'm also uh, a peer accreditor as well for the Council of British International Schools. So I, I'm involved in going into schools as well and seeing one of the great things about inspection is that quite often when you go in, although it's... Uh, sort of not great uh, or not possibly a positive experience in some situations for the person being inspected. As an inspector, when I go in, it's great because I can see all the fantastic things that are going on. And uh, I, I class myself as a bit of an educational magpie anyway. So you always see sort of things which are great and things that you can use and things which uh, will work in your own school. Um, I'm a passionate uh, sort of about ensuring that children uh, can achieve at the highest level that they possibly can. And um, I've been sort of involved for the past couple of years working on something called high performance learning, which is uh, involving uh, sort of an educator called uh, Deborah Eyre, Professor Deborah Eyre, and sort of her work involving uh, sort of promoting children and pushing them to be able to achieve at the highest level possible. And as a result of that, uh, my current school, the International British School of Bucharest, we're now sort of uh, a part of what is referred to as the high performance learning world class school. So uh, we're sort of uh, have achieved this level where we're sort of teaching the children the skills that they need in order for them to be able to become 21st century learners. Um, so as has already been mentioned, globalization and sort of becoming global citizens is very, very important. And having the uh, values and attributes as well as the sort of teaching and learning skills that children need is vitally important as well. And as I've mentioned here as well, I've got a great interest in student and staff well-being to ensure the school community have the support in place for everyone to be successful, because we often think sometimes about um, staff well-being, but uh, student well-being and staff well-being is important as well. You know, the, the children are the reason why we're in school in the first place, and in order for them to be uh, able to do the best that they possibly can, it's important that they feel comfortable and they feel happy and they feel safe and they feel that they have the resources that is needed for them. And of course, the staff need that too as well. You know, the most successful teachers are those that are happy and are feeling sort of uh, ready, shall we say, and have all the resources and everything that they need in order to be able to do their jobs as well as they can. So that's a little bit about me. Um, when I was asked to uh, sort of present uh, by the Global School Alliance, um, I thought sort of long and hard about how I would take, uh, sort of go about doing this. And I figured that the best approach uh, for me to take in this situation would be to talk from my own personal experience in my current school. So this may not fit the context of everybody, but hopefully this will give you a little bit uh, of an idea of how we do things at the International British School of Bucharest. Uh, I'm not saying it's perfect, OK, because there's always things that we can do in order to improve further and to make things better. But we do do a pretty good job, I think. So our school is um, it's a small school located in the heart of Bucharest, um, the capital city of Romania. Uh, we have 260 students currently uh, within our secondary school, which has basically doubled in size over the past five years, really. Uh, the whole school is about 400 pupils altogether and uh, being an inner city school um, we're a little bit cramped sometimes for space but we're sort of quite uh, resourceful in how, about, how we go about solving problems and issues that we might have. The majority of our pupils are Romanian but we do have a growing international community as well and this includes pupils from countries such as China, India, the UK, Germany, the US and of course uh, unfortunately well I'm not saying, unfortunately, because uh, uh, more about the situation, we have a lot of students who've joined us from Ukraine uh, because of obviously what is currently going on uh, across the border from us. 
Um, and with this diverse community and our aim to ensure that pupils all attain high performance, uh, regardless of their start points, the transitions and the well-being for staff and students is very, very important, as I uh, mentioned uh, just a minute ago. So the way I've looked at it is um, sort of the different stages, shall we say, that we have. Now, being at the end of the year, we obviously have children that are moving and joining us. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the movement from primary to secondary. OK, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, children obviously joining us uh, from other schools, whether it be other curricula, uh, but also transitions within the school. So from year to year, the process of children moving from one year to the next uh, and children moving from uh, one key stage or one sort of uh, part of their educational experience, um, as we would say, because I obviously know that there are colleagues from a variety of different curricula that are here. So. Moving from the primary to the secondary, um, we, tr we start things early um, because I think it's important when you have an all through school, um, making yourself available and talking to the parents and also talking to the students in primary from a very, very early age so that you sort of dispel this myth about secondary being a scary place and about uh, all of the teachers being sort of grumpy and sort of uh, austere and sort of uh, the approach that they're taking sort of being more about the results and sort of what they achieve. Uh, what we are very keen to do at IBSB is make sure that children enjoy school at all points. Uh, we don't sort of treat it as being uh, certainly in year seven and year eight. We don't treat it as being um, sort of all about the grades. Um, what we're more concerned about is the effort, uh, the well-being and developing that growth mindset that children sort of need really in order for them to be able to be resilient and bounce back from any issues that they have. So we start talking to the children from when they're in grade four, uh, year five. And we involve all of the stakeholders in the community. So parents are involved, pupils are involved, teachers are involved. So what this means is that we may have sort of uh, language teachers going in and teaching French or Spanish or German lessons. So I'm sorry, if the person who uh, thinks Benedicta, if you could mute your uh, sort of please. Thank you. Um, so we involve all of the stakeholders in the community. We um, sort of have teachers going in and uh, talking to the uh, younger children. So we may have, for example, language teachers going in and teaching lessons to year four, year five, year six uh, children. We would have um, pupils from year seven and year eight and our sort of older students who are prefects. Uh, so the senior students, we have the student executive, as we refer to them as, they go in and they would sort of be heavily involved in sort of uh, preparing children. And then, of course, the parents as well. So we talk to our parents and we sort of buddy up parents, too. So if there's any sort of uh, parents that have concerns about their child as they move up through the school, we can place them together with uh, another parent who may have been in a similar sort of situation and then sort of get those conversations starting. The staff and the pupils meet each other regularly. As I said, so uh, we have language teachers, going, we have science teachers who are sort of going down and sort of doing science lessons. We have regular sort of weeks uh, throughout the year. So we may have science week and we also involve, uh, involve primary students coming up to us and uh, sort of working with the children who are in year seven and year eight, too. So we start to build those relationships because relationships are really, really important in this process. Um, we involve uh, our student support team, so our school counsellor, um, the secondary school has a counsellor, the primary school has a counsellor as well, and we have a special educational needs coordinator. So if there's any students that there are concerns, or if there's any students that have sort of needs, we can involve uh, the counsellor and the SENCO and uh, sort of early on in order to ensure those needs are met as they move up through the school into the secondary. And we get regular feedback as well from pupils, parents and teachers. So questionnaires, we do surveys, we find out what sort of issues they may have. We find out how they're finding the process uh, as we move uh, through sort of the year or so. Lots of team building events are important too, um, especially those involved in the current year seven pupils so that they can go and uh, have a chat and talk to the kids. So we take them climbing, we take them on um, sort of outward bound or sort of um, sort of expeditions up into the sort of mountains. I know there's a couple of Romanians uh, sort of uh, who are here today, but um, for those of you who don't know, you know, R Romania is a beautiful country. We're very, very close to 
sort of the mountains uh, here in Bucharest, um, it's great for them to go and uh, sort of do sort of activities there as well and start to do the sort of team building activities, which really get them sort of used to working together and used to them sort of working with their teachers too. We also involve pupils joining us from other schools as well. Um, so we have some children who join us straight into year seven in secondary uh, who haven't been at our primary before. So we try to involve them too on a regular basis um, in order to ensure that they're sort of ready right from the start of the year. And then of course there's handover notes and discussions too uh, between the sort of current teachers, uh, the leadership team of the primary school and myself and my leadership team and also the uh, the form teachers of those uh, sort of those year groups. Year to year transitions, um, we always make sure that we keep the same tutor team. So, for example, our form tutors, uh, when we have uh, they start with the sort of a group in year seven, they would carry on with them from year eight to year nine to year ten to year eleven. And then uh, they move into the sixth form where they would have more sort of specialized support from our specialist sixth form tutors at that point. Uh, at the end of every single year, there's always a feedback meeting with the form tutor and also with our uh, student counselor if it's needed. So our form tutors sit down with the students in the last couple of weeks of the school year and we get them to give us fee uh, the students to give feedback. How have they found the year? Is there anything that we would sort of uh, need to improve upon? We always give our children targets, which are sort of not necessarily academic. They can also be pastoral or they can be developmental, uh, where we sort of say to them, you know, what would you like to have achieved by the end of the year? And one of the things that we're also starting to develop is this idea of a student portfolio. So at the end of the year, the children pick out uh, work that they're particularly proud of or things that they've done, which they are really, really proud of. Uh, and then they can put that together in this portfolio and then we can present it to the parents so that the parents can see how the children are sort of developed, uh, developing and uh, they can see the progress that they're making because transitions are all about progress, of course. We do pupil questionnaires on a regular basis, which give us general feedback uh, to see the area of improvements uh, that they uh, that we need to make as a school, because pupil voice is really, really important. You know, if we're not listening to what the children are saying and we keep on doing the same things over and over again, we're not going to see sort of any improvement in their well-being and they're not going to feel like they've been listening. So where there's a change in form tutor, uh, we provide, hand, uh, provide handover notes. So for example, if a teacher leaves uh, the school, we always ensure that there's handover notes for whoever is taking over that group as well. So the, teacher, the tutor will be like the, the form teacher, the person who is responsible for the pastoral care of the students within that group. There's regular communication with parents and carers. Um, I've never been in the school which communicates as well as ours does. Um, you know, we are regularly talking to the sort of parents. We're letting them know how their children are do go doing and how they're progressing. And the parents uh, talk to us on a regular basis as well, uh, which is really, really important. Uh, academically, GL progression tests, they give us uh, feedback on the progress from year to year at Key Stage 3, which is middle school uh, in the British, uh, British system. And uh, during the summer holiday, if there's any children who have not done particularly well in those progression tests, uh, because they're diagnostic and they can tell us uh, where the children may have been unsuccessful or not have done as well as they could have done, uh, we can put intervention tasks in place for them to work at over the summer holiday. Uh, because it's important, obviously, that they get a break, but it's also important that they have something to do to keep their brains ticking over to make sure that they are ready in September for the new academic year and if there's any students of concern we always uh, do pupil interviews at the start of the next year where we ask them uh, what can we do to sort of help support you and uh, prepare them especially when they're moving into the next key stage for example so any pupil joining us from outside um, we get a lot of children uh, joining us um, into the IGCSE program so uh, lots of children will uh, complete uh, middle school in the Romanian uh, sort of the, the national system of Romania and then they will join us after they've completed their national evaluations and will move into uh, our IGCSD program. So we always have uh, an entrance assessment. Um, so we use CAT4, uh, the cognitive assessment test. And what this does is it gives us an idea of uh, the child's potential, but also 
identifies if there's sort of any support that may be needed, whether it be sort of English as an additional language or uh, SEND support. All the children get to meet with me um, as head of secondary before they join us, um, so I can have a chat with them and find out a little bit about them. And they would have a taster day in school as well with a feedback meeting at the end of that day, where again, they get to meet with me and they can tell me sort of how they found their day. And that sort of gives me an idea of how they've settled in, but also it gives me sort of some suggestions possibly as to things that we can do a little bit better maybe. We request references um, along with a safeguarding and also a learning questionnaire. So the safeguarding tells us has there been any issues uh, that we need to be aware of. And the learning questionnaire gives us an idea of how well they've done in their previous uh, school in terms of the curricula and in terms of um, sort of the progress that they've made. We run an induction uh, where sort of children on the first day or so, uh, we go through sort of all the policies of the school, what the curriculum's like, who they should see, if uh, there's any issues, you know, who are the important people to go to. And um, sort of the children are on probation for a period of time as well, because sometimes, you know, when you move to a new school, it might not work out for you. It, it might not be the rare, sort of the right school for you. And it's always important that you have that opportunity to sort of take a step back at a particular point, um, but also it gives us time to support and uh, sort of help the child uh, as they move through. And we also sort of use a pupil uh, mentor or a pupil buddy. So we get a student within uh, their particular form group uh, who's assigned to them and works with them. But we also use our student executive team, our older students who sort of are there as well to sort of provide um, a support because children you know, sometimes will tell uh, older students things that they won't necessarily share with their teachers. And then we have student counsellor meets with the uh, students to sort of find out how their experience was at a previous school and how they're finding things so far. And then I have a meeting with the parents after the first month where we sort of collate information and we can give some feedback and find out how things are going. Now, as I mentioned, uh, key stage three is sort of middle school in the uh, sort of the British system. So it's sort of lower secondary, you could also call it. Um, when you finish key stage three, which is after year nine, so you do year seven, year eight, year nine, uh, you would then complete both um, the Cambridge checkpoint exams in English, maths and science. And we also do GL progression tests in English, maths and science as well. And this then sort of tells us um, sort of how well the child has done over the course of key stage three. So it gives us valuable data as they move into their IGCSE program. So. All pupils participate in a project as well where they can develop and hone useful skills for IGCSE and this has become more sort of important as we've sort of embedded high performance learning skills within our school. And summer work is provided for students by each subject in preparation for starting IGCSE. So what we try to do is get them sort of ready earlier by giving them sort of things that they can do in order to sort of give them or develop their skills even further so that they get a head start, shall we say, as they move into the IGCSE programme. We give them study skills and revision skills sessions, um, which are sort of prior to the checkpoint examinations as well, because it's amazing the number of children who don't know how to study or revise properly. So we need to sort of prepare them by giving them these skills. And we started to use sort of uh, artificial intelligence as well with uh, platforms such as Century and also Seneca Learning as well, which gives them the opportunity to control uh, their sort of um, their learning and sort of take real responsibility for it. We have careers talks and we also use a platform called Unifrog, which gives them sort of uh, information about potential careers that they could uh, go into and potential opportunities for university uh, programs. A lot of our children will sort of uh, go to the UK, but quite a few of them will also uh, remain within Europe as well. So it's important that they know uh, what is open to them and what they need to do in order to uh, achieve or transition into the career that they want to take at a later point. You know, and well-being is important in this process, obviously, as well. And we have or continue to have regular meetings with parents, pupils and staff. And as they move from IGCSE into our A-level programme, again, Unifrog becomes even more important because um, A-level is when you start to really sort of narrow down the choices that you want to make and you're starting to think about university courses. And obviously, it's important that you make the right A-level choices to enable you to go on to the university that you want to do. 
And again, we have regular discussions here at this point with subject teachers, uh, our university counsellor, and also with parents, which give us uh, enables us to uh, give guidance to the children. We have further study skill sessions, and we also have an induction uh, process. So we have a two week induction where we sort of prepare children for moving into the A-level programme so that they become more independent and become sort of more independent learners. And we provide them with summer work as well, again, for the transition to A-level. Uh, two of my children are just moving into A-level now after completing their IGCSE. So they're hard at work in sort of doing maths and art and various other things in order to prepare them for when they start their A-levels in September. And again, regular pupil questionnaires and small group meetings are important to gather feedback and hone and develop our program further. I've mentioned a lot about children, staff, you know, when staff join us, okay, quite often they'll be moving from other British curriculum schools, but sometimes they're coming from uh, other sort of curriculum. So we do have some Romanian staff, for example, in our school who uh, are teaching the British curriculum for the first time, potentially. Um, so it's important that we sort of have regular contact from the teacher from the moment they sign that sign their contract, you know, try to make them feel as welcome as possible. If it's your first overseas posting, OK, you want to know that uh, everything is going well and you want to sort of have that uh, those regular meetings, especially if you're, for example, appointed in the November and you're not starting your job until the uh, August of the following year. Brexit, unfortunately, has caused issues with regarding visas and things like that. Uh, now, obviously, Brits are sort of persona non grata in sort of some EU countries or it's certainly a lot more difficult in order to uh, gather sort of or obtain visas uh, but the same would apply for sort of other national teacher so we provide as a school we provide support with gathering documentation for visa applications i know schools in the uae will do as well because obviously that's quite a stressful part of the process of, uh, of joining a school we have heads of departments or our sort of a, or a buddy is appointed to support with the move as well. So they're in regular contact too, and they're sort of giving them sort of the access to uh, the resources that we have and sort of giving them uh, information that they may need. And we also ensure all of our uh, staff uh, complete CPD courses. Uh, we use a platform called Educare as well as National College. Uh, which ensures all of our newly appointed staff have the same skill set as the uh, staff that we currently have in place. And uh, every year we expect um, our staff to complete these CPD courses in order to make sure that they are sort of uh, ready and uh, have the necessary uh, knowledge and understanding in order for them to be able to work at our school effectively. And we also have an induction fortnight, uh, which uh, includes a, a day or two, which is set aside for new teachers to the school to in, in order to make sure that they are sort of ready and prepared and uh, sort of uh, can get going right from the first day of the school year. And then finally, um, we also ensure our school counsellor um, sort of is involved. Um, our staff, uh, our school counsellor is not just for the students, uh, she's also for the staff as well and it's important that she's involved because as i've mentioned you know staff moving overseas for the first time especially if they're younger members of staff may find it difficult and they may be homesick and you know it's important that they have that um sort of uh sort of ear shall we say uh, somebody listening to them and somebody sort of championing them and supporting them um so to finish off really, because um, i've talked a lot about transitions but uh, well-being obviously is really really important too and basically, the community well-being at IBSB um, basically comes down to communication. Um, it's important that we are regularly communicating with each other. Um, we're talking to each other. So the students are talking to each other. Students are talking to teachers. Teachers are talking to students. And teachers are talking to each other as well in order to develop that sense of well-being. You know, we've gone through particularly difficult times with COVID. And we now have uh, the Ukrainian war on our, uh, our doorstep as well in Romania, uh, which sort of caused some fears, shall we say, um, sort of a couple of months ago or so. And um, as a result, you know, we sort of uh, it, we got through that process through ensuring that we were all talking to each other and checking in on each other regularly. Uh, we do feedback questionnaires, a pulse check on how people are feeling. Um, it's sort of really good way of identifying sort of any issues or sort of any areas which we need to work upon uh, quite quickly. 
Our, our high performance learning values, um, empathy is a really important part of how great learners behave. You know, those, uh, so we encourage our students um, to be empathetic to each other and also our staff to be empathetic to each other. Um, we have a CAS program, uh, although we're not an IB World School, uh, we do community action service in our school and it's a fundamental part of our program. So our students and staff are committed to supporting those in need and we work with a variety of non-governmental organisations in Romania, uh, supporting them and raising awareness of what they do. And uh, all of our students uh, in year 12 and year 13 um, play a massive part in that programme and we've had some really, really successful uh, collaborations over the past um, sort of 20 years that the school has been in existence. We have regular social events for staff and students, um, so we organise uh, get-togethers, um, sort of quiz nights, things like this, ensuring that school's not just about um, sort of that working environment, but it also enables sort of friendships and relationships and uh, sort of the build up within our community too. And also ensuring that sort of our staff, um, so our Romanian staff are sort of mixing with our expat staff as well, because in some schools you often see, see that split, uh, but sort of within our school, we tend to see sort of um, both the expat uh, staff um, sort of going out and socializing with the Romanian staff as well. And it really builds that sort of uh, team ethos. We have a student executive uh, with a pastoral and well-being committee and that's run by the students for the students. So they put ideas in place um, in order to sort of support their colleagues and um, they meet regularly with the deputy head of secondary who's our pastoral lead uh, in order to make her aware of students that uh, may need that sort of shoulder to cry on or that little bit of extra support uh, because they've been made aware of it themselves. Uh, our student counsellor um, is excellent and she does regular parent talks as well, where she invites parents into school, um, sort of talks on parenting and how to support children, um, especially around exam time when it comes to uh, sort of exam stress. And then our school newsletter uh, regularly has lots of tips and guidance in there of uh, things that we can do or parents can do in order to support their children. So. I think I've probably gone a little bit over time there. I didn't anticipate this actually taking as long as um, sort of it has done when I first put this together. But um, if there's anything that sort of uh, you found useful, then that was, that's fantastic. But if you would like to contact me, please feel free to connect with me. Uh, my email address there for uh, the school is um, just there on the slide. But I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm trying to use LinkedIn more um, as a sort of a resource for sort of talking to like minded educators. Um, but um, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to listening uh, for listening to me. Uh, hopefully I've not rambled on too much and uh, I will now sort of pass stop sharing my screen and uh, pass back. Thank you, Matt. That was amazing. That was, that was very insightful, I think, very useful to see the processes you've got in place and things. Um, we do, I'm having a quick look in the chat. There are a couple of questions and it might be easier if they ask them maybe. So I know Fethi and Jamel have both put a couple of questions in the, uh, in the chat. Fethi, would you like to uh, unmute and, and maybe ask Matt a question? Oh, yes. So thank you first, Matt. You have lots of expertise, that's clear, okay. Uh, uh, basically, in, in Tunisia, we don't have this type of culture, I mean, a culture of taking into consideration transition from maybe school to school, from age to age. Uh, my question is about gender. Uh, is there any difficulty dealing with transition related with, let's say, maybe girls? I don't, I'm not sure if this exists or not, but with girls, because maybe they are more vulnerable to biological transitions and so on. This is my first point. And the second, the second one uh, is about what are your recommendations? That means from where to start if we are new to this culture, from where to start? Thank you. That's a really good question, actually. And um, I think that I suppose it's a difficult one to answer because uh, obviously there's cultural differences in sort of a, a variety of different places around the world. Um, in terms of puberty and sort of the sort of the changes that obviously happen with girls as they um, sort of move into womanhood, um, we deal with that through our sort of citizenship program, our um, our uh, sort of uh, what we call uh, personal um, sort of personal uh, sex and health education. 
um, sex and relationship education, really. And what we talk about there is uh, it's more about relationships than anything else. Um, puberty and those sorts of things are dealt with uh, there, too. Um, but they're also sort of taught within sort of biology as well. You know, in different parts of the world, obviously, there's sort of uh, different approaches to how we take this. And I know in sort of the UAE, for example, there's moral education and um, and so on, which is sort of uh, really important. And in a way, what we're doing is moral education, too. But what we're doing is we're sort of preparing them for those stages by sort of letting them know what's going to happen, but also we're looking at relationships uh, in a way from the sort of how they can be healthy as opposed to sort of what should be happening. So we're looking at it from the aspect of, um, you know, what is not a healthy relationship, um, you know, and that relationship is from friendships. Um, so, for example, looking at bullying, um, you know, what constitutes bullying, what constitutes, um, uh, I suppose, uh, the... I'm trying to think of how to phrase this, actually. Um, you know, what is acceptable in terms of a friend? So, you know, how should you behave when somebody is, is sort of talking to you and so on and so forth? And that applies to boys, not just girls. I mean, from my point of view, in terms of the transitions, I think that the important thing is that children feel listened to and they feel that you actually are sort of taking their viewpoint on board and they feel like that they can contribute in some way, shape or form. Because quite often the complaint is, and talking from a, an inspection point of view as a, a school inspector, Inspector. You know, quite often when you talk to children, some of the time they will turn around to you and say, uh, you know, the school doesn't listen to us. And when you dig a little bit deeper, you find out that there are reasons why that has potentially happened. But also they, the children are being listened to. It's just that then they're not being fed back to. So I think feedback is important as well. So when you're listening, OK, you should also then give feedback to the children. So, for example, if you ask them, you know, how can we make this process better? And they tell you, you go away and talk about it. You can then sort of fed back and said, well, now you've told us, uh, you know, we, we take on board what you said, and this is what we're doing as a result. You know, so I think feedback is really important too. Um, I, I hope that helps, Fetty. Yeah, that's yeah, okay. We have lots of, but how to start? Instead how to start? Culture, yeah. What that's you reach it now? How yeah, did you start it? yeah. How did we start it? Um, I mean, in Britain, it's been something which uh, you have done anyway. I think we have that culture in the UK now where we have that sort of um, homogenization of things where sort of people are taking a similar sort of approach because it is sort of deemed as being best practice. So my idea, my suggestion to you would be is to sort of talk to other colleagues, um, sort of... Uh, in Tunisia, talk to sort of other people and see sort of what approaches they're taking sort of to do this. Because obviously with any sort of um, approach that you take, it has to have that cultural awareness there. So taking something sort of completely that I'm doing in Bucharest, you know, some aspects of it will work, but other aspects aren't going to fit into, you know, the uh, sort of the culture of um, sort of, of Tunisia or Egypt or sort of uh, Nigeria or anywhere else. OK, it's, it's got to be sort of... Uh, fit with your culture I suppose is the best way of putting it. No, thank you many thanks. Okay my pleasure. Thanks Matt thanks Vethi. I agree I think um, it's all to do with change Vethi. We found in the UK they did um, research in the past to show that uh, transition from for instance from a primary school to a secondary school the, the learning went backwards. They, they didn't actually they even went you know because they did that gap and even between being you know years or stresses so a lot of it is um the reason we've associated i think with well-being is because a lot of it is if you give children confidence to cope with change and difference and get and, and realize that change is part of life it's more sort of very focused on their well-being to cope with something that's new giving them that self-confidence that it's okay to, to it's all right to worry about changing your teacher changing your school um but we're here to support you so again like it, there's, there's some great uh, information shared there and and i think our next speaker also has got an awful lot of in, interesting things to share so um if i can hand over to serish would you like to take the screen and and share yours too thank you
Hello, everyone. Good evening. I'm um, Sehresh Safar from uh, um, Dubai International Private School. I'll be talking about end of year transitions and students' well being in schools. Uh, let me first introduce myself a little bit. I'm working in uh, um, Dubai International Private School from last four years. This will be my fifth year starting the next academic year. I have 10 years of experience, and all my experience is in Dubai, UAE. I started my career in Dubai. And so uh, since last 10 years, I have been working in Dubai. I have been working there of course initially I started my career as a teaching as a teacher I was working as mathematics teacher and then I was head of department for mathematics and then initially now I'm uh, just finally I reached the where I should be like what I thought my career should be now I'm head of middle and high school in Dubai International Private School we are following American curriculum California common core standards uh, as well as I have been uh, an active member of accreditation committees in our school uh, our school is accredited by NIASC and Cognia I'm I'm also a senior leadership member uh, for my school. I have been involved in school self-evaluation and improvement planning, and we have been working on how to improve students' well-being and how to focus on staff well-being to improve students' achievements. Um, I'm also providing uh, professional development to my teaching staff, as well as looking for our students, uh, looking for and planning for activities, and also planning uh, the whole annual, uh, um, annual you know, uh, plan for our students that how to enhance their well-being, which activities will help us, how to conduct surveys and all these uh, issues, pastoral care as well as academic issues. Uh, I'll just give you a brief about my school. Uh, my school Sarish? is located at the heart. Uh, sorry, Sarish, are you able to put your camera on? It'd be quite nice to see you. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Sure. Can you see me now? Yes, that's wonderful. Thank you. So my school is located at the heart of Dubai. Uh, school was established in 1998 with 200 foreign students enrolled at that time. Whereas now in 2021-2022, we had uh, 2,193 students in this academic year. And uh, we have almost 42 different nationalities of students. And uh, we have around 30 different nationalities of teaching staff with us. But our school is quite diverse, so we need to, uh, you know, consider all the cultural barriers and all the differences, and then we celebrate uh, the similarities of students. So today, the focus of my meet, uh, my presentation will be. I think there is a delay. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear, we hear you fine, Sarish. I think there is a slight delay on the on the um, presentation. It does seem to be taking a while. To, yeah. To, yeah. Let me. Yeah. So my um my focus. Just a second. I apologize for the delay. I think there is some internet issues or. If if you if you prefer, Sarish, I could play the, the. Do you want me to play the presentation for you? You can just tell me when to to. Um, I to. I think it's fine now. It's working. Okay. If there will be any delay, I'll let you know. I'll just turn off my video just to ensure that uh, there is no delay in internet. Uh, so today we will be exploring some challenges students face during the end of year transitions, and then we will be identifying the strategies to support students' well-being during these transitions. So what I feel is transitions are always like what I feel is the transitions are like bridges. So uh, as they connect from one point to another, they move, uh, the, uh, these bridges are like where they're connecting students from one phase to another phase. So we need to ensure that the students pass through these bridges smoothly. I think my presentation is now working. Uh, may I request you to please present from on my behalf to you? Yes, certainly. Do you want to stop sharing and I'll share and I'll put the, your- Yeah, definitely I will. Thank you. Okay, let's see if um, I can get it to play a bit better for you. Okay. Is this where we're up to? Okay. Yeah. Here we go. Do you need the next page now? Yeah. Okay, just... Uh... So, and, and again? Yeah, thank you. So the... Uh... 
yeah, that's fine. So transitions are like bridges. So we, we need to make sure that the, trans, the bridges are as smooth as for the students so that they can easily move from one phase to another phase. Transitions can be welcoming for some students. They might be excited, like be the, what's coming up next and let's see what's going to happen in our next academic year. But for some students, it could be challenging. So we need to make sure that we are not neglecting those students. We are planning well for those transitions and we are ensuring that those students, they, what are their needs? We should need to identify their needs Needs, and we need to support those students so that they can move forward in their academic life. Move next, please. Just to share with you all of, we have been through tough times and students have been through so many transitions during these last two academic years. They have been through from face-to-face -face learning to distance learning and from distance learning, we moved them to blended learning, from blended learning again to distance learning. And now, Alhamdulillah, we are back to face-to-face -face learning. So, Students have been through so many transitions and during these challenges, you know, they, they really needed our support and this time built resilience in them. Uh, they were challenged enough and they know they have self-confidence. They know how to deal with transitions more than before. So now during these three years, I have felt that the students have more self-confidence. They have resilience. They have built, uh, uh, they have built confidence and they know how to move from one phase to another. Please move on to the next one. So what could cause, uh, what are the reasons for end of year transitions and challenges? Why students feel pressed out? Why this Can we stay muted, please? Sorry, Sarish, can you please unmute, please? Sorry. Uh, no problem at all. So uh, what are the possible reasons for end of year transitions and challenges? Students have stress due to the academic tests coming up, due to end of year final exams coming up. They are, uh, they are you know, they have a lot of stress. They have anxiety. They have depression that the what will happen with us, how we will be promoted from this grade level to next grade level, especially grade 12 students. They have a lot of anxiety in which at a university they will get enrolled in. Uh, they have stress for the graduation. Then they have, which you, uh, they, because in UAE, what is happening our students are going abroad they, they are taking admissions in a, uh, universities abroad in UK in Canada in America so they have uh, you know this stress that they need to get this certain percentage similarly this is happening with other grade levels for middle school students who are going to have high school so they are they are you know consider they are stressed about if they will not get the score what is needed which path they are going to opt for because now in UA we are offering them general paths we are offering them elite path and advanced path so you know all these uh, factors are related to their stress they, ha they have. So the, if they have, they, if, if their uh, if stress is not handled carefully and they, they are stressed out, then it will cause anxiety, depression. They might, you know, they might not, uh, they, they might not be confident in moving from one academic year to next year. They might have mental health issues and uncertainties. So we have to plan very well for these uh, transitions and we have to cater very well with these challenges. Sarish, are you muted? Um, no, I, can you can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yes, thank you. Yeah. Let's move on. So as I just mentioned, if, if we are not dealing with these issues properly, then it can cause resistance, distraction and avoidance and anxiety in students. So we have to deal with all these issues uh, properly. We have to plan for it and then we have to deal with it. We have to stay calm and we have to let students know how to verbalize their emotions and how to communicate. Unless they will communicate with adults, unless they will communicate with their teachers, with their counselors, with their parents, we, they will not be able to express themselves. So we have to teach these skills to the students to speak up for themselves, to verbalize what they are feeling, their emotions, and communicate with someone around them. Next, please. So when we talk about students' well-being, well-being is a very broad word. We need to consider what is well-being. So for, for when we talk about well-being, we have to consider students' physical well-being, their social-emotional well-being, as well as their cognitive well-being. Next, please.
When we talk about physical well-being, it includes safety, physical activity, nutrition, health choices, and perspectives of the students. So how can we make sure that their well-being is promoted? So for physical well-being, we need to ensure that the students, they, they know and they understand the importance of safety and they take personal responsibility for safety for themselves as well as others. We should make sure that they regularly participate in physical activities. If the students they are participating in physical activities, they may experience improved health and fitness, and they uh, they they might have uh, you know their feel they might have reduction in the feeling of stress, anxiety, and depression, and then they have enhanced executive functioning skills of learning. We also need to make sure that those students students are having access to nutritious food. Students having access to nutritious food are, uh, and they, those who make good choices of food are more likely to have good physical and mental health, health as well as they, have, they are successful at schools. Also, those students who have positive outlook on themselves and others are aware of the consequences of risk-taking behavior and are more likely to make possible uh, responsible choices and experience enhanced well-being. When we talk about social-emotional well-being, it, it involves connectedness and belonging, self and social awareness and relationship uh, skills, general life resilience and self-management and responsible decision-making. So students, when they feel they are connected to the school and they're valued member of the class and the community of the school, they have a positive, caring and inclusive and respectful relationship with their peers and staff, then everything becomes smooth for them. If the, if the students feel they're connected to the school, it increases their overall engagement and participation. It helps the higher level of academic achievements and it, it helps in reducing the antisocial and disruptive behaviors and as well as pros, it develops the pro-social behavior in the students. Also, the students develop self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making when there is deliberate guidance and instruction in these areas. So we need to make sure we are guiding them and we are, uh, we are uh, developing programs to ensure their self-management, self-awareness skills, or, as well as the students who are resilient, they can manage their emotions well, they can cope up better with the setbacks and demonstrate positive social emotional skills, as well as they have enhanced well-being. Now comes the third part of the well-being, which is cognitive well-being. So we should, it, 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 it has high expectations. We should have students' voice included in everything. Students' academic resilience and self-efficacy is built, creativity and innovation. So uh, students' cognitive well-being is enhanced when students feel that they are engaged and they have high expectations. Now, uh, all students are different. They each to, uh, we have to set different standards for each student. All the high level of expectation should be different for each one of them. As we have low level, middle level, and high level students, so our expectations should be different for all students. We cannot set the same expectation for all. We should have higher level of expectation for all students. We should have clear learning goals. We should have authentic and relevant learning tasks and we should give them on uh, ongoing and timely feedback so that they know what to improve how to improve and what is expected from them students should have uh, students who have meaningful opportunities to participate in decision making at the school and classroom will see their sense of meaning and purpose and overall engagement in the learning increases as well Students who are encouraged to work from their strengths tend to learn more rep uh, readily, perform at higher levels, exhibit greater motivation and confidence, and have a strong sense of satisfaction. When students have an appropriate level of challenge, this, this increases student engagement, risk-taking, and self-efficacy. Students who are provided with a safe environment for taking risks and are encouraged to express uh, innovative, uh, innovative, creative, and original ideas experience more positive emotions and greater intellectual engagement.
So now, how can we deal with all these uh, challenges which students face and during transitions, and how can we enhance their uh, well-being? So first thing which I'm telling you from my experience in my school is we created a social emotional learning program in which which we keep well-being of the students and on the front line. So we have to ensure that there is a program uh, uh, which which is especially designed to uh, designed to deal with the students in a way that enhances their uh, social and emotional and mental health. So due to this program, the students, uh, the objective of this program was to feel and show, uh, to develop in students resilience and self-confidence. So uh, what students are doing is through which students acquire and effectively apply the knowledge, attitudes and skills which are necessary to feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships, set and achieve positive goals, make responsible decisions and understand and manage emotions. This is just a template to show you like how the SEL program helps students to develop. This is developed in collaboration with counselors. And after doing the survey, we took the feedback of the students that uh, what where they feel they are strong at and which give us an idea about which area our school and our students need more help. So we designed the SEL program based on, based on the results of uh, the Dubai Wellbeing Census as well as internally conducted surveys. So this will help us develop resilience and develop self-confidence in our students. Next, please. Another strategy is creating safe environment for the students to overcome challenges and enhancing their well-being. So, what can we? How can we create a safe environment? Be predictable. We can. We we have to make an environment where students can predict what's coming up next. If the students they don't know what will happen to them, how things will be, then of course it will cause you know it will cause uh, anxiety and depression in students. So students should be able. We should create a culture in which students know what should, what is coming up next what will happen when we will come back from uh, from summer vacation how things will be especially in high school when the students are in grade 12 we should uh, arrange for them uh, we are we are also arranging in our school career guidance and counseling we are having university fairs we are having career talks so that students know they can predict what's going to happen in their future what's coming up next so this is very important to have predictability for the students so that they they are not afraid they are not scared of what's coming up next we should uh, we should set routines for the students so that they know that after doing A, we have to move to point B and from point B to point C. So if there are clear established routines and we are uh, firmly uh, firmly uh, sticking to our routines, then it, it will help students to move from one point to another easily. We should set clear goals and expectations for the students. We should nurture relationships like relationships among peers, between students and teachers, between school staff, as well as uh, parents, as well as uh, the whole school community. Uh, we should cultivate friendships for the students so that these transitions are easy for the students when they move from one, one grade level to another grade level. When we have new students, we have a new new school, new buddy program in which we are doing, uh, we are making new friends for the students so that they don't, they don't feel left out. Same as we should do uh, the students who are, we are merging students from one section to another so that we are uh, making sure that the students know other students and they, they celebrate uh, similarities and they accept differences and they, they faculty in the school environment. Uh, and we should definitely provide individualized support to the students who ever need it. Not all the students, they need support, but those students who need individualized support, we should uh, clear, uh, we should develop clear plan for them and we should develop clear set, uh, set targets for them so that we can deal with them individually rather than dealing, them, uh, dealing with them as together as a group. Next, please. Next. 
So as I said, we should plan for the uh, very well for the transitions. We should provide students with clear expectation and prepare them uh, with what to expect. Providing students with orientation will, ha will help because at the end, we are providing orientation to the student what to expect in the next academic year, how things will be, what is expected from them, how to prepare themselves during the summer break for the upcoming year. And also when the students are back, we should have a check-in with the students. How was their summer break? Uh, they can share the stories when they share the stories of uh, what happened with them during the summer break then it helps them bridge and comes uh, slowly back to the school environment and parental score definitely it's needed because parents should uh, should uh, are considered as partner in students education and in their educational life so parents are involved should be involved in these transitions they should provide support as well with the, to the students thank you so much that's all from my side if you have any questions you can ask Thank you so much, Zerish. Does anyone have any questions for Zerish in particular? I, I, I didn't, couldn't see the chat because I was sharing my screen. Um, I think there were some questions in there, were there? Uh, Cyan, did Cy Cyan, would you, if you'd like to unmute or would you like me to tell, say your question? You did mention in the uh, chat, can you give an example of each step of creating a safe environment? Uh, that could take a while, actually, couldn't it? Um, we will share this presentation so that you could have a look at it in your own time. This is being recorded and it will be shared on the platform. Um, did anybody want to unmute and ask Serish a question? Yeah, possible. Go ahead, Fethi. Yeah, since she, uh, since she has been talking about post-COVID maybe now, and we are talking about going back to face to face. Are there some plans for this transition between this, uh, these two years learning and now the post COVID face to face, especially talking about discipline? We have been a bit flexible and maybe uh, more lenient these two years. What about coming back face to face about dealing with discipline? Sarish, do you have an answer for that? It's drawing them back, isn't it? That's a that's a great question and everyone around the world face this uh, difficulty when the students are back to face to face there we are, we do face uh, disciplinary issues but you know it's it's very important to make it very clear for the students initially we have to be a little bit flexible with the students we know they are coming back to the campus after 2 years and we definitely were ready to face these issues the next thing which I mentioned is orientations are very, very important for the students. So we need to make very clear for the students what is expected from them, how things will be, and what will happen if they are not going to, you know, adhere to the code of conduct and the post school policy. So what we did is we in the in in the first uh, uh, in the first week what we did induction week what we did we we uh, planned activities for the students, even for the high school students. We didn't start it directly giving them academic lessons like we did uh, funny glasses day, we did blue day, we did funny socks day, just to enhance their well-being. For one week, we were just giving them induction and orientation that we are so happy to see you back. There are some rules and regulations which you need to follow. And gradually, we move them. Initially, we ignored them. First warning, second warning, third warning. And then we move on uh, based on our code of conduct, uh, moving them from disciplinary actions. So initially, we were quite lenient. And gradually, we started implementing our code of conduct, which helped us to reduce these issues. And by the end of the year, like, uh, um, you know, three, four months were quite difficult, but then things were uh, going to be quite smooth. There were some students who were really, really facing difficulty back to, uh, you know, when they were back to campus, but the counselors really helped us uh, prepare individualized plan for them, which really helped them. We were, they were having one-to-one -one sessions with the students, parents were involved, and if any outsourced help was needed, uh, we, we considered that as well. That's that's an amazing answer. Would that that helps that, uh, that I think that that's a great idea because I think so many schools felt under pressure that they had to go straight into the academic learning again because so much had been missed. They felt the pressure that you have to go start learning. But like I said, getting them back into used to being in school, learning again in the in the classrooms and with each other, setting expectations is a great way to start. Uh, just another thing, uh, uh, Tony. Just another thing. We want to see more UAE school involved in our uh, Global School Alliance. <laughs> so uh, uh, we invite uh, our, our speaker to, to help us do this. Definitely, I'll, I'll definitely do that. Thank you. For my school, yes, for sure. 
please do yes the more the more the merrier like I say we are trying to encourage schools all over the world to come and share this wonderful uh, best practice and Zeris you've done a great job today Matt thank you so much from, from Romania as well um, unfortunately I don't think our South African uh, speaker has managed going to manage to join us which is a shame um, but maybe she will make one of our conferences in the future um, Citizen Cam Cam I know you've got your hand up would you like to unmute yes I think there's there's a follow-up question in the chat from Yasmin, she's also asking if uh, alongside with the student, teachers also go through uh, face issues with the face-to-face, -face. is there any uh, steps or rules that our presenter can help us? Yeah, anybody got, so yeah, yeah. so basically what support the teachers have is they have the same well-being issues. Sarish or Matt, would either of you have? Yeah, true, that? true. I will definitely answer your question. You know, uh, staff well-being is as important for, uh, as important as uh, students' well-being. Definitely, 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 100 times it's as important as to st uh, students' well-being. If staff is not satisfied, they are not happy, they are not going to give the same results, they're not going to teach the students the same way, they're not being productive, they will not be productive for us. So what we did for staff is, uh, you know, we have been very, very lenient with our staff during this time. As you know, in UAE, what happened during the summer, uh, during this pandemic, uh, everyone was getting uh, salary deductions and, um, you know, uh, uh, no summer vacation and deep pays and all these things. But our school really supported our staff. The first thing is through financial help. This will help, uh, you know, the staff to develop well to to support their well-being. Secondly, this just uh, we were quite lenient during this time with our staff members. Uh, to ensure that we are providing all the ar arranging for them. We are not providing, actually, we are arranging all the hospitals and vaccinations and whatever is needed for them as well as their family members. Thirdly, when they were back to school, uh, what we did was we offered them programs like yoga classes, after school, uh, you know, clubs. So this helped to ensure their well-being. Now, what is happening is you should have, you should provide them shoulder. You should understand what, what they really need. Sometimes staff is exhausted. Sometimes they cannot take one is missing the other one cannot take substitution and all these things so you need to make sure their workload is balanced this is extremely important if you are giving them a work which they cannot handle of course their well-being will be impacted so we need to make sure that their workload is is, is balanced and they have a work-life balance as well so uh, when you are doing such things it will definitely ensure that your staff well-being is uh, you know maintained and appreciate appreciation is also one of the very important key which i missed here is you, when you appreciate your staff and you understand them well definitely definitely they will do much more for you uh, um, i conducted multiple times well-being survey for my staff i just wanted uh, to know from them what should i do for them to make them happy so there were different responses i need a gla glass of juice during the break i need an open space so that i can take my students outside so these small little things wishing them birthday giving them um, appreciation certificate will help to enhance their well-being to add what to uh, Sarah said, because uh, we sort of took it from a slightly different point of view in that um, staff, uh, I agree completely, staff well-being is really important, uh, as I mentioned, and student well-being is obviously sort of uh, important too. But what we found with staff was uh, they didn't want sort of, um, because there's always this debate about staff well-being and uh, the cynic in me always turns around and says what a lot of staff want is to do less work for more money. And so, you know, if you look at it from well-being, it's that sort of from from that point of view, that is what some people turn around and say. But uh, what we found with our teachers was what they just wanted to be able to. They wanted people to listen to them, so they wanted to have the opportunity to talk and be able to sort of offload any concerns, any worries, anything like that that they we had. So we basically provided opportunities for uh, sort of teachers who would volunteer to basically sit down and be available to listen. To to any concerns that people had so that they could sort of talk about uh, worries that they had. You know, we made sure during the pandemic that uh, sort of in Romania, uh, we were locked down from March 2020, I think it was until sort of the, the summer of that. And then we actually then only really closed down again for a very, very short period after that time. We tried to keep schools open as long as we possibly could. Uh, possibly could. But in terms of sort of vaccination and all of these sorts of things, we obviously sort of would encourage that. Uh, I mean, having said that, though, Romania is one of the lowest uptakes of uh, vaccination within sort of Europe. So th there was that sort of choice there. Nobody was forced to be able to do it. But 
we did lots of things like, for example, uh, when it was somebody's birthday, uh, we allowed them to take the day off paid, for example, so that they could celebrate it with their family. Um, we sort of uh, would allow staff to leave early on particular days if they weren't teaching. Um, all of these sort of these sorts of things, too, uh, we gave gifts and sort of um, sort of tokens of appreciation uh, so that and sort of went around and talked to people in order to make sure that they knew that they were sort of being listened to and that um, you know the leadership team of the school uh, really appreciated all the work that they were doing and th that seemed to work quite well because uh, in terms of our staffing for example you always sort of say as an international school normally most international schools have staff turnover of about 15 percent uh, we lost two teachers um, so our turnover sort of during COVID was basically about 5% in terms of staff. So um, we, we must have done sort of something right in the approach that we'd sort of taken, really. But um, I think it's staff well-being is always a difficult one to answer because there's so many different sort of approaches that people take. Uh, and there's so many sort of and I think each person is individual. I don't think there is sort of a whole blanket thing that you can actually do in order to sort of make everybody happy other than just to make sure that your door is open and that you listen to people. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I agree. Like I said that everybody is different, but it is being valued and everybody is under new stresses now, I think, since the COVID, because everyone's got different pressures, different stresses. Uh, but knowing um, they, someone they can go to and knowing that everybody, other people have the same stresses, I think is definitely a, an, a good thing. And like I say, having the door open. Um, I'm just trying to see if there are any more questions in there. There have been quite a few questions coming through, actually. A lot of things like you know, re-motivating the students. They can't get them to read and write when they come back um, because the priorities have gone why bother you know what I mean and I think uh, people are getting back into the, the value of learning and uh, motivation to learn seems to have changed I think those are some of the questions um that are in the in the chat if any Terish or Matt would you any answers to those sort of uh re-motivating students I'm trying to think what other questions were there in there too yeah I think I think a lot of uh, um yeah I think we have sort of answered. I think most of the questions have been answered. Does anybody else want to say anything while we have uh, some time and we have speakers here or anyone wants to share anything? Please feel free to unmute. Wonderful. OK, like I say, I don't think there's um, there doesn't seem to be any much conversation, more conversations at the moment. Oh, oh, actually, Yasmin has mentioned involving parents in the process. Um, how, we were talking very much about the teachers. We were talking very much the pupils. Um, do schools involve parents in this process or is it something that only the teachers and the pupils are involved in? Would anyone like to uh, answer that? I think there's been a lot of difficulty with uh, sort of schools in that teachers not, or parents not being allowed to be in school and this is something that we faced. Um, they weren't allowed on school sites, they couldn't go past the school gate and actually that sort of disrupted some of the relationships anyway. Um, what we try to do is uh, be online with parents as much as we possibly could so and make them uh, available. Uh, now things are obviously a lot better and I mean it was talking about the behaviours and uh, noticing sort of changes that we'd seen we we would be honest and open with the parents to let them know you know what experiences uh, we were facing in terms of their child's behaviour or their or a year group's behaviour you know we struggled with our grade eight our year nine for a while because um, they're going through puberty they're sort of talking about transitions they're transitioning into adulthood or sort of becoming young adults and as a result some of the behaviours weren't as great as we uh, would have liked so we got the entire year group in all of the parents and we sat them down and we talked to them and we explained look we need your support and help in order to uh, sort of move things forward in this situation because I'm sure you're not happy either you know and as a school leader I think it's really really important that you're open and honest with people as much as you possibly can be uh, you know, sometimes you can't sort of give the entire story, but, you know, the majority of time you can sort of uh, definitely be open with parents and uh, ensure that they are fully aware of everything that's going on. Thanks, Matt. Yes, it's re-establishing the routes to communications again, which I think have changed, haven't they? Citizen Cam, Cam, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thank you very much. So just to add a little bit to what Matt said. So one of the things that I... We taught our teachers here in Ghana during the COVID is getting to know your student because we, we can't we can involve 
or we can't invite the parents to the school. But when you try, when you get closer, when you get to know your students, then you know the challenges that they are facing and how to address them with the parents. Because some of the issues doesn't even be issues in the classroom, but they are issues that they bring back from the house. So when you get to know your students very well, you understand that, okay, this particular problem is a problem in the house. Then together, as Matt said, we conduct a survey with the parents or we send emails to the parents for their feedback to see what is happening at home, how best as teachers we can also help to address those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful contributions. Amazing. Again, um, I say, was there, does anybody else have anything to say today? Otherwise, I would suggest this can be continued on, on the platform, on the Facebook page. It would be great to get more of the members, even the ones who couldn't come today, along today, to maybe to, to contribute to this. It seems to be a very popular topic. Um, and like I say, the, the, the August one will be about... <clears throat> making the environment welcome in the classroom to get them back in, in, the, in the, after the summer. Um, and the September one will be about developing um, uh, cultural capital in your classroom or within your school. So um, unless anyone else has anything they'd like to contribute, I'll say thank you very much to our amazing speakers and thank you everybody else who participated and joined us today. Uh, and we're looking forward to seeing you again at our future conferences. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. We shall see you again soon. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Thank you.